starting we can start now yes hi good afternoon everyone and welcome to our pep talk um, on the occasion of world kidney day and this is initiated by newberg diagnostics to help everyone get a better understanding on the early recognition of kidney ailments and uh, we of course are hosting it and presenting it Newberg Diagnostics, as we all know, is a leader and one of the most trusted names in pathology and advanced diagnostics, as well as preventive healthcare services. Combined expertise of Newberg Diagnostics ranges around 250 years plus. Global, uh, global quality standards and accreditations, uh, services spanning across four countries from the UAE, South Africa, USA, and India, with access to state-of-the-art facilities, over 120 labs, with a large workforce of over 200 plus pathologists and a range of over 6,000 tests, we're capable of processing over 30 million tests per year. Uh, today in our pep talk, we are very proud to introduce our guest speaker for the occasion, Dr. K. Abirami, MD, MRCM, uh, MRCP, DM Nephro. She is a member of the Fellowship of Nephrology in Canada and a consultant nephrologist at the Kaveri Hospital at Salem, Tamil Nadu. Our moderator for today's conversation is uh, our very own Dr. Saranya Narayan, MBBS, MD, Microbiology, um, Newberg Diagnostics Technical Director and Chief Microbiologist for Tamil Nadu. Dr. Saranya is a specialist and a noted speaker on the subjects of blood banking, cord blood banking, medical ethics, and microbiology, just to name a few, and she's spoken in conferences worldwide. She's also a accomplished laureate and has published many papers on these subjects. I hand over the conversation to Dr. Saranya to begin the proceedings. Welcome one and all. Uh, thank you, Craig, uh, as usual for a great introduction and good afternoon, Dr. Abirami. It's so lovely to see you face to face. I have only spoken to you so far. No. And uh, yeah. on the occasion of uh, uh, World Kidney Day, uh, which was yesterday, which was celebrated at, at, at yesterday, uh, we felt there couldn't be a better speaker than you, uh, having interacted with you so very many times. So um, I would like to start the ball rolling by just asking you, um, you know, in your practice, you've been having uh, so many patients across different age groups uh, coming to you. So what would be your take on the current status of renal disorders in this country as against the other parts of the world? Okay, the biggest difference is going to be due to diabetes is what I think. As India is heading towards becoming the diabetic capital, so obviously the kidney disease follows through. Uh, even in India, the commonest cause of kidney failure today is diabetes. So once our population increases, the diabetic population increases, uh, we definitely expect an uh, epidemic of diabetic kidney disease in the coming years. Uh, apart from the diabetes being more in uh, uh, India, the numbers are going to increase. It is also that once you have diabetes, not everyone with diabetes develops a kidney disease. The Asian population somehow has an increased uh, risk for developing kidney disease if they have diabetes. We seem to have a bad kind of diabetes, if I may say so. Sorry, I, I didn't get your last statement. You A bad kind of if diabetes. If I may say so, we seem to have a bad kind of diabetes yeah. with uh, increased uh, target organ damage. So right. there's more microvascular complications. Right. So we, we are heading towards a epidemic of diabetic kidney disease. So um, what would we need to do, uh, or rather what would we need, what symptoms should I look out for um, if I want to know that I uh, do not have a kidney problem? You know, what, what do I really need to look out? What is going to be a warning sign to me um, if I were to know, say I was 40 years younger and uh, somewhere in my mid-20s, what, what would I need to look out for at that yeah. point in time? You are 40 years younger, if I may say so. <laughs> okay. Uh, at the age of 20 years, I mean, uh, kidney disease happens in all the age groups. It is different kind of the kidney problems at different age groups. Okay, when you're 20, I'm assuming you're healthy, you're not having lifestyle diseases. So at that point, more than worrying about... Uh, 
இன்ஸ்டால் பண்ணிருக்கீங்க நீங்க could we have all the mics on mute please i'm sorry to interrupt yeah yeah so at the age of 20 uh, rather than worrying about early signs of kidney disease you should be worrying about how to prevent kidney disease in your later age when you are 20 years you are not going to have early stages of kidney disease either you have had some kidney disease as a child or adolescent or you are heading towards your adult life as a normal adult in that case it's more about how to prevent kidney disease right so the main two culprits for kidney disease is diabetes and hypertension right. both of them are uh, to a major part related to lifestyle true you cannot 100% prevent by having an healthy lifestyle but it is preventable in a majority of the population by maintaining an healthy lifestyle even if it is not preventable it is well controlled and you can protect yourself from the other evils of these two diseases so when you are starting life at 20 i think the goal should be the first three commandments of the renal diseases so healthy lifestyle active be active regular physical exercise no smoking everyone knows about smoking and lung disease smoking about cancers uh, right. people do not know about smoking and kidney disease right. smoking is not good for the kidneys it is a risk factor for kidney failure so smoking should be avoided so healthy lifestyle physical exercise no smoking and avoid processed food i'm not going to say don't eat this don't eat that i mean you are 20 obviously yeah. you want to enjoy but no processed food and keep an eye on what you eat no and i think especially in uh, the current scenario of post covid and even in the pre covid time when we had uh, you know all the it sector functioning all the time very actively this kind of eating of processed food and now during covid time relative inactivity uh, for most of us uh, who sat at home i think these are these must have been triggers have you been seeing any increase in uh, renal disease now following all of this in the last uh, few months i mean i'm seeing an increase in renal disease related to covid per se okay covid can affect the kidneys and one thing we see in our opd is our regular ckd patients they come for a regular check up and their creatinine has gone up and then we wonder what happened and then they have just a small fever nothing they, the covid was not that significant but they develop renal complications but what i do see is uh, in the younger population pediatric so children uh schools you know like i go to my son's school yeah i do yeah. not recognize any of them they have gained weight like anything so yes. the adolescent obesity is something yes. which is a big problem now with covid yeah in fact that was the next I question i think adults were always a oh, little yes. active whereas children were some... had a very good active life in school right. so right. for them being at home for 2 years yes take a toll Now, apart from covid um, what about children picking up renal disorders you know right from like uh, they they always say that <clears throat> from the age of 5 to maybe around 15 or so it's mainly congenital uh, disorders of the kidney that one sees uh, but so how frequent is that in our country how often do we see that okay in children we see four types of kidney diseases okay one is nephrotic syndrome uh what they used to call ud kamala in something like that in tamil okay this is nephrotic syndrome this is a benign condition in a majority of the children and uh, as they grow it becomes all right so this nephrotic syndrome is they have leaking of protein in the urine and the child swells up like a balloon and uh, they respond very well to simple drugs like steroids uh but they keep having it again and again till they grow up but this is totally cured by the time they are 13 14 or they are entering adulthood in most of the children what i find very pitying is uh some of these kids because they keep having it again and again uh we do tell them that this is normal you will be all right but parents get very worried they go for other kinds of therapy uh wale wale do more damage yes you're on mute dr abirami you're on mute here you're muted okay 
can't hear you. So this is one thing that really upsets me because it's a benign condition. Uh, this is a benign condition. Uh, parents take it more seriously and uh, do more harm by going for a lot of quick fixes. The second group of diseases we see is starting from childbirth. So they have some structural problem starting from the kidney to the end, to the point where they pee. So anywhere in the uh, conduit, if they, they have obstruction or some abnormality, the development is different. It could be multiple things, like the two kidneys could be fused. The right. kidney can be in a different place. Right. Uh, the tube which is connecting to the kidney could be a little narrow. The tube connecting the kidney to the bladder, the bladder end could be narrow. Or there could, be, there could be some bladder dysfunction. So yeah. instead of pushing the urine out, it could push the urine back into the kidneys. Or finally, when the bladder is pushing out the urine, there could be some valves there which can cause a block. Yeah. These are the kind of problems we call it cahout. It starts in childhood from many times uh, diagnosed even before birth mm -hmm. in the antenatal ultrasound and most of the times after birth. Okay, This group of disorders, you cannot change. It is the way it is developed. But there are a lot of things we can do to prevent major morbidities in the future. So these children, uh, how the parents can pick up is the child is crying when it is voiding, peeing, or uh, the urine, uh, the speed in with which the baby voids. You know, it is very common when you lift the baby, it, it exactly waits for that moment to pee on your face. <laughs> I'm sure uh, everyone has had, uh, anyone yes. who has had kids in their home has had pee on their faces. Yes. So that's good. It should be there. If it is not there, if that speed is not there, yeah. that is abnormal. And the number of times the kids void. So if there is a change, they are, they are voiding every five minutes. Yeah. You change the diaper and it's wet immediately. You change, it's wet immediately. It's not too much, but it is constantly wet. Yeah. These kind of signs that they look for, if we identify these structural problems, they can be corrected many a times surgically, sometimes endoscopically, uh, but it prevents major kidney disease in the future. This is the second group of kidney diseases. The third group is uh, the kidney uh, function itself is less in kids, congenitally so. So in that uh, many a times, they go on to develop renal failure very early, like within six months, one year also, and depending on the severity, if both the kidneys are affected or if it is only one kidney. The fourth group of disorders are the ones which are majorly missed as kidney disorders. Here, there's no problem with the functioning of the kidney per se, in the sense the filtration is fine, but kidney does a lot of other things. It is not just a filter. It regulates blood pressure, but it regulates all the salts and minerals in our body, including sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, a lot of other things. It helps in keeping the bones healthy. It helps in production of blood cells. So these group of disorders, there is a problem in the regulation of the minerals and the salts. Maybe you're losing potassium more than what it should be. The babies are losing phosphate more than what they should. So they develop uh, what we call tubular dysfunction. So they are, uh, the subtle signs are the baby is peeing a lot. And the moment you give a feed, baby is voiding, doesn't gain weight, and is chronically irritable and constantly crying. These group of disorders are missed many a times because people, I mean, the baby is peeing well. If you look at creatinine and all, it is normal. Uh, but the baby fails to thrive. If this is picked up, it's very easy. You just need to supplement those minerals, the baby will grow up to be a very healthy adult. So yeah. these group of disorders uh, need to be uh, carefully looked for. And I'm sure pediatricians will do that. But parents might think of it as other things, you know. It is just that baby is not uh, eating well, drinking well, will be all right as it grows. 
maybe the milk is not okay then they try changing formula so at some point if the baby is not thriving well should think about uh, tubular disorders you were mentioning that is really beautifully explained by you you were just mentioning um, about the nappies getting wet constantly but these days we moved from nappies to diapers and a lot of uh, especially the upwardly mobile uh, families they only use diapers and that poor little kid is in a diaper the whole day through and is very blissful and the more more than the child being blissful the parents are blissful so uh, has that contributed also to an increase in uh, uh, renal problems see diaper per se would not increase the renal problem uh, but uh, if it is not used appropriately if the change doesn't happen promptly especially if the ch uh, child had, had a bowel movement right see the urine will be soaked up and it will be dry but if yeah. the child had a bowel movement and the child did not cry or did not indicate and it's lying in its own uh, uh, fecal material that is not good yeah so most of the times urine infection comes from our own gut from yeah. our own bacteria so if they are lying in the diaper without prompt change yes urine infections are likely to be more and i always wondered how they get away with so much diaper without a rash yeah. so yeah. like if anyone has used diapers yeah. uh, in the adults and all in the long term they'll know what i mean the right. diaper rash is such a big issue getting away from it when you're constantly using diaper is yeah. difficult yeah right. so my first question to those moms is how do you do that <laughs> yeah 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 uh moving on to the next question so if any of these children come to you or anybody comes to you uh with possibly a renal problem what would be the laboratory tests that you would want to do first that will help you pinpoint that this is it this is not uh something else apart like if the child is present with any typical uh urinary tract symptoms or failure to thrive but say the child just comes to you with an anemia and they've been going around uh, to several doctors for a treatment of anemia but which hasn't improved the child is still not well and the child now comes to you how would you kind of narrow it down and say this is a renal problem what are the tests you would do laboratory tests that you would do as i mentioned earlier kidney does a lot of things not just filtering out the water so one of the important thing the kidney does is it produces a hormone called erythropoietin this is the hormone which makes the marrow produce red blood cells and prevents anemia so once you have anemia in an unexplained setup why should a well nourished child or coming from a family with good nutritional uh, i mean there is no socio economic issues why should the child be anemic so the light should go on at that point either the child is bleeding or as having worms in india worms would be the first thing so that i'm sure the pediatrician has looked at and has handled it so once you handle that if there is a refractory anemia kidney disease should be thought of that should for me that will go first when i see someone with anemia and a little bit of swelling uh, kidney disease is the first thing that comes to my mind at that point it is something to do with kidney function reduction so what we call uh, kidney failure kind of thing so creatinine would be the number one test if i had to do only one test but usually we do a few tests together in one go for a basic kidney disease that is urea creatinine electrolytes and a urine examination i would think i can diagnose 80 90% of kidney diseases with these tests right now uh, you mentioned that by avoiding uh, you know rather by uh, having a healthy lifestyle activity and avoiding smoking and um, avoiding processed food one could prevent oneself from getting a, a renal disorder but uh, i do know that uh, several years ago uh, somebody whom i knew maybe purely anecdotal but i don't think so this person took an antibiotic for an infection and then went in for complete renal shutdown 
and uh, I think he had to be admitted in hospital for a while. He was perfectly well before that, and thankfully is now well too. He's got over that incident. So, uh, what are the drugs uh, that uh, we take that we need to be careful about taking? Because in his case, it was an antibiotic. He had no known allergies to it. Uh, so he was prescribed an antibiotic by the doctor and he took it and then had a renal shutdown and they said it was possibly an autoimmune uh, renal problem. Allergic. Mm. Uh, so like... Uh, how Good you brought it up. Yeah. Yeah, good you brought it up. It's my pet peeve. Okay. I keep telling, uh, I keep telling, I don't know, uh, the current generation who carries Saradon and whatnot in their pockets. A little bit of a headache, they immediately pop in a pill. And, uh, and mild body ache, they want to go out, they immediately take a pill. When drugs are causing kidney disease, there are two things. One is the drug is known to cause kidney disease. It will go sit in the kidney and it will damage the kidney. There are certain groups of drugs like this. Uh, one is aminoglycosides, a group of antibiotics. And the other is uh, predominantly in the onco segment drugs used in cancer and all. The third, those two are unavoidable many a times. You are using it for a particular indication. The third one is the NSAIDs mm. or the painkillers. Mm. So the painkillers can directly cause damage to the kidney by uh, the, the, their mechanism of action itself affects the kidneys. Mm. So taking painkillers should be totally avoided I used to joke, osteoarthritis should be a risk factor for kidney disease. So it's not like osteoarthritis is associated with kidney disease. All the older people who have joint pains because of the age-related uh, uh, damage to the joints, they are constantly taking these painkillers and they actually come to the doctor first time for the kidney problem rather than for the joint problem. So painkillers should be totally avoided. These group of drugs act by affecting the kidney. Everyone knows it does that and we should be avoiding it. The second group of drugs are, they are not known to cause renal disease in everyone. They don't act by going and sitting on the kidneys, but some of them can cause an allergic reaction in the body and that allergic reaction affects the kidney. In this, two main groups. One is the antibiotic. Okay, that is at least given under the supervision of the doctor and he would be watching out for these things. The second one is the PPIs. You know, the drugs which we use for uh, acid peptic disease, gastric ulcers, acidity, the so-called acidity. So the omeprazole, the pantoprazole, the isomeprazole, rabiprazole, these are available over the counter and these drugs can cause allergic interstitial nephritis and I know a lot of younger people having aseptic disease or dyspepsia basically and taking these drugs continuously. If it is given for an indication, it should be used only for the indicated period. A doctor gives you a prescription for four weeks. Doesn't mean next time you have the symptoms, you just take the same drug. It may not be the same disease in the first place. Even if it is the same disease, every drug has a role and uh, it should be taken within that period. You know, there is a saying in Tamil, Alavukku minjinal amardamun nanji. So anything we, which you take could be poison to the body. It should be taken only when indicated, only for the indicated period, only in the indicated dose. So some of these drugs are unavoidable, but many of them are avoidable and we are just popping them. Yes, we're just abusing them, right? Absolutely. So, uh, do kidney problems run in families? Uh, this is something that uh, several people worry about. Uh, the fathers had a problem, so will I? Am I also at risk of developing a kidney problem later in life? Traditionally, there are quite there are some diseases which run in families. Uh, some of them are genetically transmitted. The main example is something called polycystic kidney disease. That is the commonest uh, genetic disease which goes uh, from generation to generation. So these diseases are not totally preventable or treatable uh, as of now, but we can uh, 
prevent uh, complications related to these diseases and they can have good quality of life and i mean some of them do survive 60 70 years of age also so the these are genetically transmitted and goes from generation to generation the other group of diseases like diabetes and hypertension they are not exactly genetically transmitted we do not know this one particular gene if it is there in the father and then in the child and the child would get it but it is polygenic it's a multiple genes not only the genes but it is also the way we are brought up the environmental factors the social factors so they are very commonly in families that right. many of us know parents have diabetes children have diabetes i, I have uh, patients coming in telling me my family is full of diabetics from right. there so that's kind of a common story and everyone is aware of that right. so these are not traditionally familial but it runs in families and these i said are the biggest reason for kidney disease so we should worry more about these familial problems right. the other pro- problem in these is you live in the same socio economic uh, situation like right. your parents yeah so you are kind of going to eat the same food have the same lifestyle so right. if your father or mother had diabetes and they landed up in trouble then you should know your lifestyle is not okay at least their lifestyle not okay and you should at least change right right Right. right absolutely um there has been a question that has already come in i think uh, questions are coming in fast and furious which is really nice and um uh, dr windu asks what lab clues do you look for to alert that this could be a case of renal tubular acidosis as i said uh, when i run a panel i ask for sodium potash i mean electrolytes in general apart from urea creatinine and urine uh, examination so the electrolytes gives the biggest clue for tubular disorders so when there is renal tubular acidosis the bicarbonate would be low that would be my starting point okay okay great great uh another question that's come in from another doctor is uh, if you uh, do you advise genetic testing for pkd1 and pkd2 genes for people with a family history of ad pkd okay if i have uh, patients with clear cut family history i have people with two generation three generation and they are having disease i don't insist on getting the gene, genetic testing done but i tell them in future if there is a gene therapy and all then we will need to know what kind of gene you are having there are different uh, genetic changes which can produce the same adpkd pkd1 and pkd2 are the biggest uh, two things but there are other genes also so if we i mean i keep telling this every time i give a lecture on adpkd we are very close to gene therapy and it should be here soon so if and when the gene therapy is there yes it is a must to get the gene uh, pkd1 pkd2 tested the other time i would test is if this is a first generation families there is there are no other family members having it this person has polycystic kidneys looks very classically like polycystic kidney disease but to determine whether it is autosomal dominant recessive what is the pattern i would ask for genetic analysis right 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 point taken now this is a non medical i mean rather this is a question from the general public <clears throat> several women and young girls particularly they drink less fluids when they go out for a movie or go out to have a day out with their friends because they don't want to use the public convenience however clean so how safe is this it is not <laughs> yeah the simple answer is it is not i can at least understand when they are going out for a movie and all but uh, all the children in school going age who i see with urinary infection give me the history i'm surprised they take a 200 ml water bottle to school mm-hmm. and they have not used the washroom in the school for the last how many months i don't know so they very proudly tell me i do not know what the washroom looks like 
so that is not okay uh, you should not do that so normally i there is a corollary question to this how much water you should drink so there is no single answer it's not like 10 glasses of water 3 liters it's nothing like that our body knows how much of water it needs it will tell us by thirst mechanism so when we are thirsty we should be drinking if we ignore the thirst we condition ourselves to ignore the thirst and not drink is not okay if you have done it for a very long time and you are so used to it you now don't know how much to drink then i tell them to look at the urine they should be avoiding at least once in 3 to 4 hours and that urine should be light straw color you know the hay it should be that color light yellow if it is very dark the amount of water they are drinking is low it's 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 not enough depending on the season and the physical activity water requirement would change yes even 1 one, 1 one half liters might be enough um, but for an active child in school going through pt and all they would need 2 to 3 liters of water i also scold the parents actually how can you send the child to school with a 200 ml water bottle so you also encourage the child's habit yeah <laughs> you should have insisted on a 2 liter water bottle yeah yeah Well, and if, I think this also should apply to people who go gymming or who are, you know, nowadays the cycling fad and the running, marathon running has all caught up. I think they need to consciously increase their water intake, isn't it? Definitely. Definitely. Now, the other thing is uh, these keto diets that we are hearing about, keto diets and all these other diet fads that we hear about. Um, how safe are they because in relation to the kidney how safe are they uh, there are some people who talk about soya diets so uh, you know cauliflower diets soya diets other keto diets good question again uh, i'm asked this question very repeatedly and then they tell me doc you are so thin so you don't worry about this like so don't you. give me this lecture <laughs> no i uh, my take on this is two things for any diet any change you need to observe it over many 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 years before you can say it is absolutely safe in the medical field we know there are drugs which came up and it was uh, well appreciated everyone thought that is a panacea kind of thing and then eventually we came to know this could cause this problem this could cause that problem because it was being studied and over 10 years what we knew about the drugs at the end of 6 months is different from what we know about the drugs at the end of 10 years so the keto diet and all these diets are relatively new and uh, so when, when someone tells me it's absolutely safe my cousin has taken it and then there is no problem i don't accept it these are anecdotal i cannot go by one person someone should have done a study they should have compared same obesity obesity itself is a risk for kidney disease that is something many people do not realize so as it is you are at risk for kidney disease and uh, someone should do a study with all these obese people and randomize them to get this diet and the other diet and see what happens over many many years so they do tell me like i have gone through my basic uh, blood test all of them are looking good and my dietitian said i could go for it my only advice is i do not know what would be the long term consequence of this but there is a value for a balanced diet that has been known over millions of years that's not something you can negate just by looking at your aunt or your cousin who's done it for 3 weeks so who would does this keto diet or any other fad diet i am sure they cannot sustain it for many years and it is very well proven even by the dietitians and even by uh, the keto uh, people once you stop the diet you get back the weight right so why put yourself at risk for a temporary result right. why not try something which is sustainable and when you are trying to lose weight please remember your bone structure you can only be that thin 
so as long as we accept that we aim for being healthy not some particular number a uh, balanced diet should be the way to go if you are going for keto diet please get the basic workup done make sure you consult a doctor but on follow up also repeat the blood work yeah right okay now you spoke about osteoporosis a little while ago and uh, contrary to what we believe in india where the sun shines brightly uh, 11 and a half months of the year uh, i think most of us are vitamin b deficient to some extent or the other may not be in the insufficient maybe in the insufficient or grossly insufficient ranges so um, how much of these vitamin b deficiencies are actually caused by renal disease okay again kidneys do regulate the bone issues so uh, the vitamin d gets activated in the kidney and then it regulates the calcium and phosphorus so vitamin d deficiency when we are looking at it the way we do now like by looking at 25 hydroxy vitamin d that deficiency must be nutritional and the sunlight right that is not due to the kidney disease right but uh, the active form the 125 dihydroxy vitamin d yeah. the deficiency could be due to renal disease again the anemia and the bone disease occurs earlier in patients with tubular kind of kidney disease so when you have tubular kind of kidney disease you do not have decrease in urine output you do not develop swelling so many a times this kidney diseases are missed so they might come especially in children coming with fractures repeatedly you should think about kidney disease and uh, problems with the mineral disorder right mineral bone disorder And uh, how often have you come across renal tuberculosis as one of the diseases that you see? Because okay. I think I'm yeah, renal tuberculosis used to be a very common issue. As an undergrad, I had seen many, uh, but over a period of time, it has decreased. Uh, for someone to get genital urinary tuberculosis, they should have missed the first hit, which is the lung tuberculosis. it should be very unusual in the current age and era but we do see uh, gen- uh renal tuberculosis in older population yeah. the other ones who had pulmonary tuberculosis when they were younger and during that times the tuberculosis treatment was different was not this efficient and when they grow old and when their immunity comes down a bit it gets reactivated and they come with renal tuberculosis otherwise in childhood young adults we don't see it nowadays because i remember we uh, saw a couple of people who had repeated urinary tract infections with the same organisms and it was treated and it would come back again 3 months later and it was very frustrating to the patient and there was no structural abnormality or anything then just on a hunch we screened for uh, uh you know for tb in the urine and then bingo we not only saw the bacilli it also grew and both these people were put on treatment and recovered but i think this is something that i think uh, is not often thought of unfortunately especially with repeated utis i think it would be wise to also keep an eye out for this um in where there's no other reason for it where there's no other structural abnormality or anything to talk about uh um, this is something that has been uh, bothering everybody and uh, uh, we are often plagued with this question in fact and i think this is something uh, that is of great concern to you as an nephrologist so uh, when do you decide that uh, medical management for a patient with kidney disease is no longer going to work alone but needs to have a person needs to be on dialysis and how would you decide what kind of dialysis and how long that's going to be useful for the patient because dialysis the minute you mention that word it's like as if there's a death knell for the patient so uh, your views on this and how you you know treat your patients so when we say dialysis what we mean is there are two things we do one is we do dialysis in an acute setting someone has had a malaria or some severe infection or maybe snake bite they develop kidney disease 
and kidney failure also these are called acute kidney failures and these patients uh, might need dialysis temporarily but they will come out of it so that's not what we are talking about yeah we are talking about dialysis for chronic kidney disease nowadays uh, chronic kidney disease is staged into five stages stage 1 2 3 4 and 5 stage 5 that is when the kidney function is less than 10% of what it should be then we call it uh, end stage renal disease we actually don't like to call it end stage renal disease for the simple reason like what you told the moment we say that they think it is the end of life and it is end of the kidney or the end of life they are two different things okay so now we call it ckd stage 5d okay at that point we tell them now you need to go on dialysis okay this 10% uh, when the kidney function is less than 10% not everyone is very sick most of them still have some kidney function and are able to function my biggest problem is convincing them that your kidneys are not functioning and you are heading towards dialysis uh, what happens is they ignore it at that point and then they land up in a crisis now the kidney doesn't work anymore you are not excreting any urine you are totally bloated up you cannot take the next breath and then you are coming for dialysis that is not good so the point of starting dialysis is when the kidney function is less than 10% right before you head to a crisis okay so the doctors would be able to tell that based on the blood reports especially the creatinine values it can be converted into a gfr value and if it is less than 15 ml then it means you have reached that stage at that point you should be open to the discussion about what you want to do so once we reach that stage there are two options one is dialysis and the other is transplant transplant is uh, when we change the kidney uh it is not truly a change of kidney it's not like we remove the existing kidney that is something everyone believes no we just put in a third kidney in a different place yeah okay transplantation i'll talk uh, the next question maybe so now we'll talk about the dialysis so when you are deciding on dialysis most of the time we decide on dialysis only transplant is never done as an emergency it's not like my kidney has reached 10% i'm going to transplant tomorrow it cannot be done like that there are many regulations we will discuss it so it's usually dialysis which is done uh, right away so there are two options for dialyzing one is dialysis through the blood so we use an artificial filter it is attached to a machine called a dialysis machine and the blood is drawn from the patient blood is pumped into the uh, filter that filter will remove the water and the toxins which were the kidney would have removed the urea the creatinine and then the blood the purified blood is pushed back into the patient what the machine does is only a pump it pushes out the blood and pushes it back in the filter does the filtration right okay this dialysis is called hemodialysis or hd and this is done in an hospital setting it should be done three times a week ideally but some patients we do recommend lesser dialysis if their kidneys are still functioning a bit okay there are other forms of dialysis called peritoneal dialysis where we use a membrane inside the abdomen that membrane is called peritoneum it is there it is in everyone's uh, abdomen so that membrane itself can filter out the urea and the uh, other waste material so what you do is you put a tube like thing inside the abdomen and then put in some water kind of thing inside that will soak up all the urea which comes out through that filter and then you drain it out the make the two forms of dialysis are approximately equivalent each has different kind of logistical issues and different kind of medical complications Right. so depending on your social background your family support distance from hospital your other medical conditions the doctor might advise one over the other but for the majority both are equal and both the options are open so once the kidney function is less than 10% if you have an open mind and you start thinking about this you can plan 
get some access fixed for these dialysis to do either of the dialysis we need to fix up something inside you for a blood dialysis we need to fix something in the blood vessel for the peritoneal dialysis we need to fix a tube in the abdomen so we should plan that and should do it but what i find in majority of patients is even patients who have been following with me for years together when i finally say this is it we been going towards it we been discussing this multiple times but at that point they decide they want to try out some other therapy then they say okay i don't want to go on dialysis then they go for alternative medicine i am not an alternative medicine specialist i do not know if it works or if it doesn't work but what do i what i do know is when the kidney is so shrunken and we are saying no medicine would work even those medicines have to work in the kidney only there is no other kidney volume left how will it work and especially at that point why you go and do all these things so please keep an open mind and start planning the next stage of therapy rather than thinking of it as a doomsday and then right. you know you go quite to all kinds of quackery and what not yeah 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 people can have very good life on dialysis average survival is 5 to 10 years i have patients whom i started on dialysis when i started my practice 20 years ago and he's still alive fantastic so yeah no one can predict when someone is going to die but you can have a reasonably good life on dialysis but how expensive is all of this uh, is it kind of uh, within the reach of the common man yes in the recent recent times allowed yes most of the government health schemes are covering dialysis excellent excellent so even and uh, when i started practice i tell 10 people you need to go on dialysis only one or two of them would start start dialysis now when i tell 10 people you need to start dialysis nine of them do the 10th person might go do some fishing around and would eventually start dialysis that's great so that's great. all the government health schemes support dialysis so it is definitely within the reach tamil nadu especially is done a wonderful job that way every district headquarters hospital the government hospital yeah. has dialysis unit and is doing maintenance dialysis now and these are in the recent times in the last 5 to 6 years oh, yes great. logistics is no longer a problem yeah yeah so now uh, beyond a certain point dialysis also doesn't work so then you're going to think about transplantation So when is that point reached? No, dialysis and transplant are not dialysis and transplant are not mutually exclusive. Right. It is not like uh, in tandem. It's not yeah. like you go for dialysis, finish, and then go on transplant. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally, everyone should think about transplant, unless you are made medically unfit. Okay, if you are medically fit, you should aim for transplant. Of right. course, there are uh, problems. uh with nuclear families getting a donor now is going to be difficult yes. and uh, we have very strict regulations about who can donate the marketing and all is now uh, majorly i mean 99% does not happen i cannot say 100% racketing doesn't happen but yeah. 99% does not happen so major regulations mm-hmm. so there might be issues with uh, getting an organ but we are uh, right. we are heading towards that also so once you are yeah. found medically fit to get a transplant if you don't have a donor you should register yourself for getting an organ so yeah. what you achieve by this registration is it is governed by the uh, noto it's the yeah. national uh, transplant mm-hmm. uh, organization it has five regional centers and multiple state level centers okay so the registration is totally computerized no one can play around uh, tomorrow even if i want a kidney it's not like i can take the next available kidney in my hospital and give it to myself i cannot do it i am the transplant person i get a kidney i can give it only to the person allotted by the node so the uh, organization allots the kidney to 
who were is the senior most person waiting in the list yes. so there can be no foolery around this so it is very transparent and very uh, uh, very much possible right in india we do the second largest number of transplants in the world after usa right but we still doing a lot of live transplants only meaning there is a relative who is giving you the yeah. kidney yeah yeah but uh, now it is picking up uh, people who are like brain dead uh, they are donating kidneys nowadays donating organs nowadays uh, but it's a very minuscule number if all of us take a pledge exactly to donate our organs yes we can easily solve all the renal failure patients problems with a donation from a brain dead donor you don't have to trouble any relative you don't right. have to be on dialysis long term uh, but i wish we do that i really wish we do that yeah yeah it will wow. be really it is still not caught up yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so even here uh, from what you say preemptive transplants are catching up so there are people who are uh, registering early enough before they reach that point where they don't need it's not a kind of a necessity they do register themselves much earlier right no no, no. that is not possible when we say preemptive transplant you need a live donor you right. need a family donor so if you have a family donor we work up the donor and get everything ready and when your kidney function is less than 15% uh, 10% then uh, transplant takes place for registration you have to go on sorry you have to go on dialysis before registering right you cannot register before going on dialysis okay 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 um so uh, you have uh, i think i think the government sponsored dialysis that you mentioned and the national organ transplantation program that we have have really uh, made a really enormous change in the lives of all these people with uh, uh, illnesses like this i've got a question from a couple of people that have come in now and uh, that is do natural remedies help in preventing renal disease by helping the treatment uh, of renal calculi diabetes etc i think this person is referring to what varithandi juice varithandi yes <laughs> see uh, there are different kinds of stones the commonest kind is when you are not drinking enough water and the normal calcium and all gets very concentrated in the urine and you are getting stone so that stone would work if you just drink water you don't even have to add varathandi juice to it Right, but uh, there are other kinds of stones where there is a metabolic problem. Either you are having a low citrate or you are having a high oxalate. So for those kind of problems, correcting that metabolic issue would help. So blindly taking a natural remedy may not work. I think you should get yourself evaluated if you keep getting stones. Anyone who has repeated stones should get this. St- get an evaluation to see what kind of stone they are forming and depending on the type of stone uh, the doctor would advise you the remedies yeah. so if it is a low citrate you can take food rich in citrate but you will need some medical treatment also right if you have uh, high oxalate you should avoid food rich in oxalate Absolutely. and uh, you should take medical treatment just blindly drinking varithandi juice i am not sure how it would help yeah. i am assuming it should be having high citrate okay yeah another question that's come in is uh, what's your take on having whey protein as part of a regular diet i have seen uh, there a lot of people now have been taking this even along with their lunch so is this really good that kind of concentrated protein as i told you before i don't believe in any yeah. diet fad Yeah. any diet yeah. fat yeah. unless one has taken it for 20 30 years and they are absolutely healthy i'm yeah. not going to take any diet fat it might be okay now it may not be okay later on right at that time i don't want to feel bad why did i do it then correct so correct. when i eat whatever my ancestors ate i know it's like three generations they've had the same dietary habit i know three generations lived well with that 
as i said if both my parents are diabetic and both of them develop renal failure i would not follow their diet pattern i would right. move off yes <laughs> so yeah you should do uh, my problem as i said with dietary fats is anything which you take in excess you suddenly realize there's something else in it which may not be good correct right. whey protein there it cannot be just protein it must be having some mineral in it some uh, salt in it so we have not really analyzed to the molecular level and we don't know 100% sure what are those things even if you have analyzed the whey protein the whey protein which we buy the brand which we buy is it pure how do we know that so right. no facts i don't promote any diet facts right 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 i think uh, today has been a really useful uh, session uh, thank you so much and i think i would just like to say that a couple of take home messages uh, always remain follow a healthy lifestyle with a lot of activity avoid smoking avoid processed food avoid uh, painkillers that is nsaids unless uh, it's prescribed for some particular reason uh, then you said that uh, voiding once in 3 to 4 hours is should be considered normal and uh, then again you said that uh, uh, you would think about uh, going in for dialysis when the kidney function is less than 10% and the test that you would actually do when somebody uh, uh, to recognize a kidney disease early would be the creatinine urea electrolytes urine examination and this kind of picks up almost 80 to 90% of the problems that people have um i i i i'm sure it, can you add any more take home messages that i might have really missed in this lot yeah i'm going to be selfish and uh, promote organ donation yes Please, all of you pledge your organs i have once you are not here you yeah. go, you can help a lot of people absolutely and what's the point in burying or burning an organ which still has life absolutely absolutely please all of you go ahead and you can pledge the organs in the noto website or uh, in the hospital you go to and with multiple ngos also yeah. please take time out to sign a pledge card wonderful thank you so much for this really enlightening session dr abhirami it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you Thank you so much it's been a pleasure talking to you too thank you thank you